All right. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Emmett Byrne, and I'm the design director and associate curator of design here at the Walker Art Center. Um, thank you so much for tuning in tonight to the second lecture of the Conversations in Equity and Design series. This series is a collaboration between Dunwoody College of Technology, MSP NOMA, AIA Minnesota, Minneapolis College, and the Walker Art Center. The project grew out of a desire to address and elevate questions of ethics, equity, justice, and culture in relation to design practices and education. The speakers were selected by students from Dunwoody and Minneapolis College who research designers working in the realm of equity. The students will also meet directly with these practitioners during the semester, furthering their engagement with the ideas you'll hear about tonight. So you can check out the uh, incredible lineup here on screen. Um, you can also, the URL is in the bottom right hand corner. You can go there to learn more about the rest of the series and also register um, for events. Also, all of these lectures are going to be archived on the Dunwoody College YouTube page. So if you missed last week's talk with um, Ronald Rael, that's already actually up on their YouTube page, so you can go check it out. Uh, just a little bit about tonight's event. We're going to start with a 30-minute presentation by Seku. Um, then that's going to be followed by a 15-minute conversation between Seku and Paul Bachnight. And then the last 15 minutes will be devoted to a Q&A session with the audience. So if you have a question during the talk at any moment, you can enter your question into the bottom, um, the Q&A form that should be at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can also use the chat to have conversations with each other during the talk, but Paul will primarily be checking the Q&A form for the questions that we ask the speakers. So make sure you put them in there. All right. Uh, tonight's moderator, Paul Bachnight, has been the Project Implementation Director at the Minneapolis Parks Foundation since 2019, where he utilizes his design and strategic expertise to connect the organization's philanthropic pursuits with community engagement and development efforts. Prior to that, Paul founded the Urban Design League in 1991, the largest African-American-owned design firm in Minnesota. Paul is also founder of Community Renewal Through Innovative Building, a nonprofit educating and engaging young people to renew, transform, and create healthy, sustainable communities of color by working at the intersection of the built environment and social change. He has served as interim project director of the African American Men Project and was the director of urban placemaking for North Minneapolis based Urban Homeworks. Thank you so much for being here tonight, Paul. Um, and now for tonight's speaker. As an architect, author, and educator, Seku Cook both practices innovative architecture and pushes the field forward through his research. He is the director of the Master in Urban Design program at UNC Charlotte and is also principal of Seku Cook Studio. In his practice, he brings thoughtful processes and rigorous experimentation to a vast array of project types. Originally from Jamaica, he received his Bachelor of Architecture from Cornell University and a Master of Architecture degree from Harvard Graduate School of Design. Seku is the recipient of a wide variety of awards, including a 2020 Faculty Design Award from the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture, a 2018 Graham Foundation Award, and a 2017 Architectural League Prize. He is currently a fellow at the WEB -E Du Bois Research Institute and a recipient of the 2021-2022 Nasir Jones Hip Hop Fellowship, both at Harvard University. Earlier this year, his work was presented in the MoMA exhibition Reconstructions, Architecture, and Blackness in America. So without further ado, Seku Cook. Thanks, Emmett. Um, thanks for that lovely introduction, um, which, which makes me, um, recently I was very surprised that I actually had a Wikipedia page, but now it's making me more dubious of Wikipedia as a medium because um, it has on there that I won a 2017 Architecture League Prize, and now it's showing up in 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 um, in lecture introductions. And um, just for the record, that's not true. That hasn't happened as yet. Hopefully, the Architecture League is is about to give me a prize, but we'll see wh wh whether that happens. But um, I wanted to continue my thank yous to. Um, to the AIA Minnesota, um, Mary Margaret Zindrin, who does great work there, to the Walker Art Center, to uh, Nathan Johnson, who um, is a really great friend of mine, colleague of mine from Cornell, and um, who, who first introduced me to 
uh, or invited me to give this lecture um, and talked about some of the new work that is happening at Dunwoody College. So I'm really um, uh, thankful for um, Dunwoody um, and all the other sponsors as well, um, Minnesota Noma, and a special shout out to um, James Garrett Jr., who I'll be talking about in a bit. Um, some of the work that that he has has um, has added to this whole body of work research that I've been doing over the last few years. So, um, since we don't have a whole lot of time, I'm going to um, get right into it and share my screen um, unelegantly, but I'm going to share it anyway. Um, there we go. There, okay. So you can forget that you saw my desktop for a half a second. Um, and uh, yeah, and I do wanna just get right into it and um, go through a presentation that usually takes somewhere closer to 40 minutes, 45 minutes, and I'm, I'm contracting it a bit, but I want to start right off the bat. Well, first, um, the I'm pretty bad at, at um, lecture titles in general, um, especially since the, the title of my book is just hip hop architecture. And I've had too many lectures titled hip hop architecture. So now I've started to um, name my lectures after, after loved ones. So uh, this one is called Heather Nicole, um, Hip Hop Architecture Evolutions. Um, and I will start by describing and talking about the book, Hip Hop Architecture, which came out earlier this year in April. Um, uh, the result of about uh, seven years of research, um, uh, two years of focused um, work being put together, and um, six months of writing. Um, and I was really lucky to have Michael Eric Dyson write the forward. Um, if you haven't read the book yet, um, I, I, I really encourage, um, you know, authors don't really care how many people buy the book, they care more how many people read the book and can engage with it. So. Um, I'll give a really quick walkthrough of some of the, the parts of the book right now. So I organized it into four different volumes. Um, so it's not too hard to see the connection with, with music, music culture, um, although the arguments go way beyond music. Um, but um, then I have organized the volumes into a series of tracks, and each one is a short essay ranging in length from about you know, um, a few hundred words to a couple thousand words. Uh, so the, the introduction volume is really um, just has a disclaimer, a manifesto that's um, my thought process about where hip hop architecture fits. And then the prologue sets you up for what you're gonna see next. Um, the disclaimer is um, one of the more powerful parts because it's something that I wrote maybe two years before writing, the, starting real writing on the book, um, because it was um, a response to uh, some of the, some of the, quite frankly, frustration and anger I was feeling after, um, after um, um, uh, Henry Louis Gates Jr. got, got arrested in front of his own house in Cambridge trying to get in. Um, so I'll just read the, a, a little excerpt from this, um, <clears throat> This book is not for you. It is not for architectural academic elites. It is not for those who have gentrified our neighborhoods, overly intellectualized the profession, and ignored all contemporary Black theory within the discipline. You have made architecture a symbol of exclusion, oppression, and domination, rather than expression, aspiration, and inspiration. This book is not for conformists, Black, white, or other. It is not for those who practice blind adherence to guidelines, rules, codes, and ordinances. It does not relegate itself to standard procedures of winning government contracts or gaining commissions to deliver services to clients in the 1%. Um, and I'll just add the, the bottom. Um, this book is not written in the journal standard third person. I am second or third to no person. Like Charlie Kaufman in Adaptation, I have written myself into the script. It is written in my voice, an avatar for the voice of the people. It is not a book about my work. Indeed, it is a collection of the works and accomplishments of several participants. However, it is a book that includes samples of my work, not as an exemplar, but as a proponent of the movement. I'm not a hip hop architect. 
I'm not even a black architect. I'm an architect. And this book is for, by, and about architects, though they may define their architecture differently than you have. And in between the tracks, there's, there's always a little um, uh, interlude with different texts. And, and I quote from songs, from tracks, and you'll see these blank quotes in there. Um, that's because it's, it's a really complex process to get, um, to get uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, rights to, to print the lyrics of any song. So um, what I do is I annotate it and tell you the track, the title, and the time code for where you can find the, the, the quote. Um, this quote from Nas is, um, you want me to sound like everything on your top 40. I'm not for you. You're not for me. So next in the second volume, this is where I get deeper into the theory and outline the history and theory of hip hop architecture as a subject, as a topic. And I foreground the fact that it's not something that I started, not a movement that I founded in any way or shape. This is something that goes back um, almost 30 years now, back to uh, about 1992, 1993. Um, and then I talked about some of those godparents um, and, and get into issues of race and gender right off the top. Um, but I also start by talking about legitimacy and authenticity and what that means within hip hop circles, as well as within hip hop and, and architectural circles. Um, and then later on in the volume, I go into um, a, a chapter on grids and griot, go about, talk about commodity, talk about um, technology, and then I outline some of the inherent contradictions that are embedded within hip hop and architecture. So in the, in the, in the uh, piece on authenticity, talk about um, Sugar Hill Gang and how there's this, this symbol of the beginning of recorded hip hop, but you know, their legitimacy, their authenticity is constantly questioned within um, hip hop culture. Um, but I also, one of the most critical parts of this section, and this is where I finally lay out um, uh, definition of hip hop architecture, which I had been resisting before that for a number of years, because hip hop is something that continues to defy definition. And once you define something, you you own it, and um, and you can claim it for your own, whether or not you you created it. Um, but here I outline that you know once we get past the idea that hip hop is just a genre of music, but it's actually a whole culture of a people. And I also argue that it's the dominant culture of our time, cultural phenomenon of our time. Um, and, and we accept that architecture is really primarily about people. It should be reflecting the social consciousness of people. Then um, we realize that an architecture of hip hop is not only possible, but necessary. And um, uh, I, got the, I finally got to the Reader's Digest version of the, of the title in this interview um, by Jim Walsh of Min Post, um, where I simply said that it's hip hop culture in built form. And you can see that then takes on a, a different meaning that can become many different things. Um, within the book there, again, in these interludes, many of the time it's not just quotes from lyrics, but conversations or transcripts of conversations that happened at different hip hop architecture events in the past. Um, so here you're seeing Craig Will Wilkins having dialogue with Taya Wynn, uh, Andres Hernandez is there, and this is from the 2015 uh, Towards a Hip Hop Architecture uh, Symposium. Uh, James Garrett also presented, James Garrett Jr. also presented at that event. Um, and then part of in that same chapter, I, I also talk, um, I show this, this diagram that Craig Wilkins created um, and where he's really positioning um, hip hop architecture as um, he said this thing that hip hop architecture should be a model of hip hop of, of architectural practice period. And he said that at one event and then the next event that we had in um, St. Paul, he elaborated on that and did this diagram that talks about um, architecture being in the center, really concerned with the object and things around the object, but hip hop architecture being uh, interested in all these other things like community empowerment, environmental sustainability, entrepreneurship, um, and uh, that the discipline of architecture needs to expand its, its definition to include those things. Nice. If you look closely, you'll 
you'll notice that the pattern on this soft broadcloth shirt is made of working man's blood and praying folks tears if you look closer you'll notice that this pattern resembles tenement row houses project high rises cell block tiers discontinued stretches of elevated train tracks uh, slave ship gullies acres of tombstone so that was an excerpt from um most deaf's uh a soldier's dream and in the chapter on grids called grids and grio i break down that that um that excerpt uh, as talking about the relationship that the black body has had to the grid in in uh, historically in this country and how the grid is seen as a kind of neutral architectural force in, in most cases by traditional architecture but it it really isn't in in an essence so if your first understanding of a gridded efficient structure is being in the the, the gully of a slave ship then um you're under when you go to uh, learn about architecture in architecture school and the grid is presented as this neutral device, then you may start to feel something differently. Um, and then the griot is this figure in West African cultures um, that was a, a performer, a storyteller, a kind of um, oral, um, oral history keeper that was able to um, really uh, operate outside the grid. And I start talking about the DJ in hip hop culture as more of a griot kind of collecting that um, collective memory within hip hop and um, breaking those, those rules of the grid. Um, so let's talk about Jay Dilla's drum style first. He figured out how to humanize the drum machine by avoiding certain things that he could have done to make it more robotic, make it more stiff. For instance, the MPC has this incredibly useful tool called quantization. What quantizing does is it takes your performance, let's say I'm playing my drum pattern. And when I'm playing it, sometimes it's a little ahead, it's a little bit behind. If your kick drums are off by a little bit, quantization snaps them in place. And so a lot of producers, they use quantize, not as a crutch, but just they just weren't thinking about not using it. And so Dilla was like, yeah, I'm just going to turn this off. The result is a discography full of incredibly off-kilter drums. This loose drumming style was incredibly influential. So that's a video that I break down in the chapter on technology, where we're talking, we're transitioning from the idea of the grid and in the previous chapter, but we're also talking about the 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 kind of attitude that hip hop has to technology um, of humanizing technology. And I quote Harry Allen, who talks about hip hop as a force that humanizes technology. Um, so that relationship with technology is very different than the current relationship that architectural field and the architectural practice has with technology, with 3D fabrication and digital um, uh, digital technology of any kind. And so um, really sets off a, a series of explorations um, that, that, that tests um, the hip hop attitude in, in technological realms. Uh, the third volume is where I get into more detail about the work that has been done um, by, by students, academics, um, uh, practitioners, um, uh, graffiti artists, that are working in this, this realm in, in hip hop architecture in practice, in education and practice. So um, showing work by Olalekan Jafus, who is one of the most amazingly talented visualizers in, on, on, on the planet right now. Um, but his work is deeply embedded with architecture because he's trained as an architect and he's also doing large scale installations right now. Um, but it's, it's also fully informed with this hip hop attitude as well. And then work from graffiti artists um, like who are collaborating with architects to, to imagine three-dimensional graffiti spaces, this from Zeds and Mar, Mar United Architects, or um, this project from sports um, 
uh, Greg Corso and Molly Hunker, where they are literally three-dimensionalizing um, a thread or a, a, the line, the hand of a graffiti artist in an alley in Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, or work by John Stott, who, who does these beautiful architectural drawings, but then layers them off with samples of, of, um, of architectural symbols and quotations, and then another layer of, um, of uh, graffiti on top of that. Um, or then it starts looking into even built works. This this um, uh, temporary this uh, a project by Theaster Gates called um, Sanctum, which was a temporary performance space installation in this bombed out church building in Bristol in the UK, um, and then showing student work as well. So this is work by Mauricio Zamora. This is his thesis project at UC Berkeley a couple of years ago. Um, where he was trying to define a hip hop inspired space, a space that um, um, in a formal language and a material language that um, exudes these, these uh, forms of hip hop thought. Um, and it also includes some work from my own students. I've run two or three hip hop architecture studios uh, while I was at Syracuse. Um, and so using the tools of the architect, the, the di diagramming tools, to break down um, a, a really classic hip hop track and see, showing where the samples come from and how they layer on top of each other and using this as a way of coding or even decoding a city. Um, similarly, uh, graffiti as something that codes and um, has deeply embedded coded language. Um, this is a project from the same semester where the students is looking at movement or different program movement in, in um, the Adams Morgan section of, of Washington, DC, and then using that to, to, to code um, the groundscape. And then that groundscape becomes something that becomes um, urban, uh, urban insertions like amphitheaters and, and um, benches and seating and so forth. And speaking of student work, going back to the original student work, these are um, reimagined um, drawings by Nathan Williams, who first did his thesis project at Cornell, his BR thesis in 1993, titled Hip Hop Architecture. And so he's the first person on record to actually investigate um, these things in his student work and um, set, the, set the stage for, um, for much of the work to come. Um, at the same time, Craig Wilkins was also doing some of his, his, his work on um, defining hip hop architecture. Uh, included here is also work by, by graffiti artists who are starting to get into the realm of architecture. So this is work by Carlos Mayer, um, uh, Mayer 139, um, who started doing sculptural, uh, taking his graffiti into the sculptural realm but then doing physical uh, architectural in scale installations based on that. Or um, Delta in the Netherlands, who is now not, no longer seeing graffiti as um, just applied to a wall surface, but as a process of delaminating an existing surface that now creates a graffiti-like um, uh, uh, ins insertion that is occupiable to some level. This is another project by Delta. This is his collaboration with, with architects in the Netherlands to um, redesign uh, or to design a part of the facade of um, uh, a social housing building there. Um, and then more, more recent work from um, Stefan Malka in Paris, who is someone who's tra trained as a graffiti artist, started as a graffiti artist, but then became an architect and then started doing work that exudes his, his, his attitude about graffiti in his architecture. Um, this is another project by him. This one is called um, a Bauhaus, where he creates a scaffolding attached to a building and then uses um, leftover windows and salvaged windows and doors to create a space. Um, obviously, this is also, um, this is also um, inspired by, by graffiti. Um, and then, of course, work by James Garrett Jr. This is a, a really early rendering of the, the juxtaposition art center in Minneapolis um, that was really informed by graffiti, his, his history with graffiti and hand styles and so forth. 
Um, and I've just seen um, new renderings of this that got released in the last couple of weeks from, um, they finally are groundbreaking on a project that I know James has been working on for over 10 years, maybe, maybe 12 years, 15. Um, so the final volume of the book is, um, is called, uh, uh, is, is about the projections and the tangents, um, the stuff that, that comes, that's related to hip hop architecture, but not exactly hip hop architecture. So I'm looking at all these movements in architecture that may bear some resemblance like deconstructivism, Afrofuturism, informal settlements, Af Af activist architecture, and what I'm calling neo-postmodernism. But first we start with, with Kanye. He's the only person who has his own um, segment of the book. Um, and I'm looking at him as a, someone who has bookended my involvement with, with hip hop architecture um, because the first piece I wrote was a piece about him being interested in architecture and what that means for a whole new generation of people, regardless of what you think about him as a person. And he also has his own design practice um, that he runs like any other um, architect would run a design practice, um, even though he's not recognized as, as a designer. Um, so of course, deconstructivism shares uh, maybe lines and forms or a kind of delamination attitude. This is a still from um, a Jermaine Dupree and uh, Mariah Carey video um, that uses uh, uh, the Guggenheim Bilbao as a backdrop. Um, Afrofuturism embodied by this, this, um, this collection of different parts of the African diaspora, the, 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 um, the imagery and the textures that then create spaces that is really directly quite similar to hip hop, although it's not based in hip hop. Um, informal settlements, this project always comes up quite a lot, um, a project by um, Alejandra Aravena on Elemental where they basically built half of this, this, this housing project and allowed the occupants to fill out the rest of it. And then there's this new collage, this active transformative architecture that's happening from that. Um, and then some work in the neo-postmodernists um, from Kyle Miller, who uses terms like mashup or, or sampling or mixing, remixing to, to describe the work that he's doing. Um, or, or um, Jennifer Bonner um, in the same category, doing similar work of, of sampling buildings and re reshaping them. Um, so I'll quickly go through some of the work, some of how that came together in the exhibition, Close to the Edge, the Birth of Hip Hop Architecture. Um, I'm gonna go through this section really quickly because there's, again, there's more in here than I have time to, to cover. But this is the show that started in New York City that then came to um, St. Paul. And this is where I was working with Mary Margaret and um, Mary Margaret and James Garrett Jr. On, on bringing that together. So this is the St. Paul version. I mean, this is the New York City version. And it was really, and this is also detailed and explored in the book as well. But it was the first time where all of this work came together in one place to be to be viewed and understood as hip hop architecture. And then this is a poster from the St. Paul version of it, which presented a completely different design challenge because it was this warehouse space. And James just recently just sent me today some new images of this space. This is the spring box building that um, he redesigned or his firm, him and Nate redesigned. Um, uh, and um, so the, the work um, of hip hop architecture has started to feed into my own work. So this is um, some of that research that I was doing based on that argument about technology, humanizing technology, where I was disrupting um, pieces coming out of a uh, 3D printer. So in the top left, you see the primitive house there that's supposed to come out of the printer. And then you see the disrupted forms coming out. Um, and this is not a software thing. This is something that's physically happening as um, the, the material is coming out of the printer. Um, and then speculations of what that might mean in the built environment, what kind of buildings are created by that, or how can we use it as a performative demolition of, of existing buildings? Um, and then using that formal language to create um, my submission to the ADUs, the standard ADU standard plan, um, process that's happening in Los Angeles right now. 
And this, this one um, just got, finally got picked up by somebody is about to build this, but it's supposed to be a standard plan for multiple iterations of this to happen across, across Los Angeles. And then working its way into a major project that I've been working on for a few years in Syracuse, that's kind of on hold now, but it's um, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 we're calling it the shock, the Syracuse hip hop headquarters, um, SHHHQ, um, and where we're taking a building that is an existing building covered in graffiti, and then we're inserting graffiti, we're, we're amplifying that to, to occupy it. So there's a short video here, um, which is going to cut into my time, but I'm going to show it anyway. Two Fifteen Tully, the Hip Hop Center for Youth Entrepreneurship, is not just a building for us to engage youth. It's deeper than that. This building is about identity. Imagine kids walking into a building that speaks to them, that has their culture, that they feel ownership of, and then it's also opportunity. It's those two things: it's identity and purpose together. So the vision. Um, I'll then um, wrap this up by talking about the project that I did for, um, for MoMA, for the Museum of Modern Art, um, part of the Reconstructions exhibi exhibition. And um, so the, the exhibition is called Reconstructions, Architecture and Blackness in America. Um, and this is uh, the cover of the, the exhibition catalog or the field guide, as we were calling it. Um, and it's part of a series um, that you may recognize, the Issues on Contemporary Architecture that started in 2011 with these three exhibitions and books. Um, and this, this was curated by Sean Anderson and Mabel, Wil Wil William, Mabel Wilson, sorry, um, and included, invited 10 architects and designers uh, black architects and designers to, to focus on cities, do projects on cities that would talk about um, the, the relationship that this country has had with, with blackness um, and architecture. Um, and so uh, my project focused on uh, Syracuse, chose Syracuse as a city, wasn't on the original list, but um, it's really an exemplar of the black condition in the United States. So um, this is in the 15th, the 15th ward is this area that was a thriving black economic center um, in the mid forties and fifties. Um, and uh, then was, was, was first part of it was removed to create, um, to create the, uh, a series of housing projects. Um, and then um, another large part of it was removed for uh, the, the Civic Center and for the, the, the freeway I-81 to cut right through. Um, and you can see the, the freeway also cuts through the, 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 um, the, uh, the housing project, Pioneer Homes, which was one of the earliest uh, low-income housing projects in the, in the country. Um, this is another image of that highway cutting through the, the city and showing you how the highway literally cuts through the middle of the, the housing project. Um, so I was also setting this up as a preemptive critique of what's gonna happen in that area where you see the housing project. Um, their, their plan is to bulldoze all of that, remove all of that housing and replace it now with mixed income housing. And they were using Atlanta's East Lake as, and the, the developers that developed Atlanta's East Lake as a kind of exemplar of great um, redevelopment of an area. However, um, and this is from the, 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 the company's website. This is Blueprint 15 that was designed for the city of Syracuse. Um, and really uh, it, it was um, only about 20 to 25% maximum of people who ever lived in any of these projects ever come back. So 25% is seen as a successful rate of return of people who've been displaced from their houses. So that made me think of this, this quote from Catherine McKittrick, where she's talking about how the history of, of black, blackness in this country, black men, women, and children have 
has been about being being displaced and replaced. We're always being placed in one area and then displaced in another area. Um, or this quote from um, Bodhi in The Wire, this is from season three, episode one, where um, they're, they're celebrating the demolition of their, their housing project. And Bodhi is saying, you know, they're gonna tear, you know, tear this building down, they're gonna build some new shit, but they don't really give a fuck about people. Um, so this is setting up the attitude for the project, and this is the site of the project, really tracing all of these layers of history of what was there before. And I was lucky enough to find some of these beautiful archival drawings from the uh, Onondaga Historical Society, and you can see dotted in the drawings of the of the um, of the the housing project is where the old tenement houses used to be. Um, so I was really fascinated by those layers of history. Um, in these drawings and um, how we could use that as a way of, of, um, of again, sampling, layering, mixing um, different, different pieces. And then I, I called it Riaucha because sampling some of this, 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 this attitude of, of you know, um, people not being removed or saying that we're not going to be removed forcibly this time we're going to really stand our ground and um so that takes the space of 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 imagining first in the white boxes a kind of banal um non-design of what will be there what's going to replace what's there now based on the density that they su suggested and based on um uh previous projects that they've done and, uh, and then on the ground, re-inscribing all of the historical layers of building that used to be there. And then when they intersect, these orange pieces become a kind of space, these, these follies for, for the people in the public realm to occupy and use for recreation and, and entrepreneurship and other, whatever else they come up with. Um, so these are some of the plans. And again, the plans were not designed. They're literally copied and pasted. They're sampled from other projects that were done. The Atlanta East Lake project actually done by um, purpose-built communities. Um, and so these are some of the floor plans um, and then uh, some more detailed drawings with um, uh, layered over ex uh, uh, samples or quotes from articles talking about this history of, of destruction within the city and some imagery from that. So um, these drawings were then um, I, I then went through a process of screen printing some of the historical layers, so those historical drawings on top of these new drawings to create this nine square grid that was shown in the in the exhibition. Um, and then uh, that that 3D landscape developed that more into these larger renderings that were also shown um, in the in the exhibition and a long section and plan. And so the last piece of the puzzle was this model, this installation, this large stoop. So a kind of full scale version. And I actually used my own stoop from my backyard that, that was being removed so that we could cut it and make it you know, something more authentic, not just a cast piece of, of, um, of concrete. And then using that to then create this base layer of, of, of plywood that is also subtracted so you can see that same subtraction from the projects happening and then 3d printing these little orange follies and laser cutting the the, the banal buildings um and then you know uh pouring this little concrete chunk that is um uh addressing this intermediate scale between the full scale and the model scale um and so this is the that piece and then this is how it all looked together um and so one of the best things that happened for me is um, from this show um, is that people then once again decided that they wanted to interact with the project as it was on site. So this was like the day after it opened, somebody wanting to sit there and, and I had to have a conversation with the, with the security guard that it was okay for him to lean on it, to sit on it, to step on it. But, um, yeah, some bringing something a little bit different to, to MoMA. So that's about all the time I have. So thanks. Well, thank you, Seku, for an like, inspiring um, presentation. Uh, good evening, everybody. 
Again, I'm Paul Balknight from the Minneapolis Parks Foundation. Um, first, I want to start out um, with your book. Um, I read it. I enjoyed it. So I didn't just buy it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, for anybody who knows me really well, any book that starts out saying this isn't for conformists, you know, I was like, OK, you know, here we go. So um, I really want to start um, uh, back at the uh, Syracuse project, because I think, um, you know, as I looked at that, at that project, um, and particularly your description in the, in the reconstructions um, uh, book, uh, which I have too, is that you talked about um, how the predominant spaces of black inhabitation in this country have been left over disposable and characterless environments. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you also talked about, you know, you know, the layers, um, you know, all of that. And, you know, right now, here we are in Minneapolis, and we're really, you know, struggling with that whole discussion. Mm. Um, you know, you know, there's a renewed awareness of the realities in the city after mm. George Floyd's murder. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of talk about clearly uh, the built environment after the unrest. Um, mm -hmm. But there is a struggle co that continues to, to think about how do we do this work differently? And, yeah. and I think the work that you just talked about really goes to that. So I wanted to maybe have you talk a little bit more about that process, how you see that, um, and you know, just more about what that means. Um, yeah. I think I think different is probably the operative word that I'm gonna pick up on because um, I, I think it took me personally several years and and several uh, frustrations to to recognize that different is okay and different is good um, and that uh, this kind of um, default or norm or uh, is 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 a myth like it doesn't really exist. Um, it's really what people call normal is really just uh, an averaging out of what everything everyone else does, right? And what everything else is. And um, or things that are safe, things that are recognizable, things that that people feel is important and good because somebody somewhere along the way told them that that's important and good. And um, in architecture, we see that so predominantly because um, you know, uh, we are trained in a way that makes us see one lane as all that is good and all that is is acceptable and all that is right. And it's and it's um, embedded within the the, the um, documents of you know the, a, the a, a contract documents. It's embedded within the way that we teach architectural history. It's embedded within the way that we talk. We you know we teach theory. Is embedded within how we, you know, just even things that are are boring but now um, uh, uh, architectural devices like the grid. It's embedded within that. So you know, if you are um, from the African diaspora and you start to confront that, you're like, I'm different. I'm other. This this conversation is not about me. This conversation is not for me. Um, and um, and then you feel like you're discarded. You feel like something left over. You feel like you're relegated to these little um, leftover pockets of of space physically, but also of of thought. And um, it took me a long time to rec realize that that's okay. That's actually where the beauty is. That's where all the all the power is. That's where you know the thing. That's where you find the gold and where where people aren't looking. Right, um, and that's what is so powerful about hip hop as a culture that they were able to take those things that were discarded and left over and make them gold, literally gold. Make them make it into a multi-billion-dollar industry, um, and and that's where I, I ground most of my work. Okay, um, yeah, I mean, and that's the resilience of people from the African diaspora making the gold out of the things that other people throw away, like chitlins, yeah. you know? Yeah, exactly. I was thinking about when, when you're talking, I was thinking about, I was going to bring up chitlins as an example. It's like, yeah, yeah, like, like this is cuisine, but it's literally mm -hmm. like what, what's left over and thrown what's left over. Collard greens, like, 
uh, yep. grits, like all grits. that. It's just what whatever is left over, pork rinds, ham hocks, mm-hmm. all that ham stuff. Hocks. It's just like leftover shit, right? Yep. Um, and this is what we had to take to make something great out of. Um, and uh, and I also I, I can't l- lose uh, an opportunity to, to to talk about this Jamaican phrase, which is Tonya Han McFashion, which literally translates to turn a turn of the hand turn something into fashion. Like it's like you take what you have, and you make it into something that's not just messed up, but it becomes the fashionable, trendy thing to do. All right. So um, I want to pick up on something that was on my list, but that you picked up too, and about you know um, architectural education. So you know, you know, I got a few years on you. So when <laughs> when I left the East Coast and, and went off to architecture school, you know, uh, in the late seventies. Um, you know, and and got there to Virginia Tech. Um, mm-hmm. All of the things, the culture, the how I had been raised, what I thought about, mm-hmm. everything that made me like who I am was absolutely no one cared. Like, yeah. <laughs> did not exist in architecture school. Did, did yeah. not exist in architecture school. So, like you said, you know, you're the other in this in this in this situation. Mm-hmm. So now I've, I've had the opportunity now, um, because, you know, I'm older, I have a daughter, shout out to Nicole, who also went to architecture school at Kansas mm-hmm. State. So now I can look at this trajectory, you know, over 25 plus years. And, and you know, what I can say is like, her experience, a little bit better than mine, you know, in terms of that, but you know, still not there. And, and I think this discussion that we're having right now and people like like you and, and James and, and Craig Wilkins and all these folks are talking, um, it's been going on for a long time. Yeah. It's not, it's not new. It's not right? new. And there was nobody at Virginia Tech who looked like you that I could have a conversation with. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Right, right. Which is so, one, which is which is really the critical part of this whole um, story. Like we cannot leave out the the reality of why hip hop architecture became a thing. It's because there's a moment in time at Cornell University where we actually had a critical mass of black and brown students in architecture who were able to have this conversation, and that only happened because of a visionary leadership of 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 Ray Dalton, who was who led the Office of Minority Education, um, our educational affairs, and he basically actively recruited all these people to come into the program and said to the administration, "No, it's not okay to have just one or two black people per year," <laughs> you know. And then all, all of a sudden, we had seven or eight or nine because, and it's more representative of the demographics of the country. So um, that was really where we were able to have this conversation. It was able to grow. And, and now so many people from that era, from Cornell, are, are superstars. Like, you know, Amanda Williams, Lacon Jafis, um, Emmanuel Pratt, one, one, you know, was a MacArthur genius. Um, you know, the, this is what's happening because of that. You know, my sister, Nina Cook-John, Hansi Better, uh, Andres Hernandez. You know, this is the, the, the space that I've been growing up in and came from which and of is course incredible. nate johnson <laughs> yeah, and Jason johnson yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah which which is incredible and and you know hats off to you and and you know what what you know i'm working on is like how do we make that happen everywhere yeah right yeah, exactly yeah I, I, I make how, that happen everywhere and it's not be just one spot it it, it becomes it becomes it's just a mindset and a decision. It has to be like, this is not okay. Like when we, when somebody decided that um, it's not okay for, um, you know, for uh, uh, 80% of our students to be male, they said, okay, we're going to make sure that we have demographic parity between male and female, right? We want our architecture schools to, to mirror what the demographics of the country are. And that was an activist action, right? Um, right. And, you know, everyone has to decide that that's okay. And that's what, uh, that's what needs to happen. 
And, you know, this whole new awakening is like, oh my goodness, I had no idea that there were no black people in architecture. What do we do about it? Everybody, it's like, we've been trying to figure that out for 40, 50, 60 years. Right. Right? Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. Um, so I wanna get back to um, a piece of the book that, that really struck me and, and you, you touched on it briefly, but, mm -hmm. it, but it was that piece uh, where uh, Craig Wilkins is talking about, about mm -hmm hip hop architecture. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, in my career, I've, I've done a lot of different things. You know, I've worked in social service organizations. Um, I've worked in affordable housing. So yeah. I've really cut across a lot of sectors and, and you know, you know, spent a lot of time with people, which it seems like architects a lot of times don't want to do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, all of the, you know, as, you, as, as Craig says, you know, the, the, you know, we exist in the in the landscape and all of the things that, you know, that are going the social and the economic, the cultural. Mm -hmm. um, but what I thought was so great, we just came out and said, look, you know, this is what architecture should be, yeah. you know, period. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, you know, and, and that was, that's so powerful because to me, that's what's missing, uh, right? Mm -hmm. That's what's missing. And so I, I wanted you to talk a little bit more about that because yeah. particularly for students, I think, you know, they're looking at that, you know, um, it's really important. Yeah, yeah, Paul. In our previous conversation, you picked up one of the most important aspects of the book um, that not enough people understand that, um, you know, when, when you first confront it or first hear the topics like, oh, wow, that's a weird idea. That's so fringe. Like these two things have nothing to do with each other. How, you know, this must be some novel new thing. That's kind of cool. Let me, let me follow it. Like, oh yeah, let me just see, try to be cool and down. Like I'm going to be into hip hop architecture. Um, but then it's like, um, uh, then the first, <laughs> the first effort is to say, this is not a fringe thing. This is something that actually makes sense. This is something that just like at the beginning when I say in the definition where it's like, you have to understand hip hop as culture and architecture as reflecting people. So if, if, you know, if architecture is supposed to reflect the cultural norms of the society, why is it not reflecting the hip hop cultural norms? And it's because of its racist past. It's because of how embedded it is in a westernized ideal. Right. And so um, this is why and where the whole conversation starts to shift. But what you're picking up on is the fact that it's not just a movement. It's a way of thinking about architecture on a whole scale. Like this is not just a proposal or of, of this one fringe element within architecture. You know, Craig's diagram wasn't like architecture is this and hip hop architecture is there. Architecture was in was in the center, and hip hop architecture is all the way around it, right? right. And it's, and that's the that's the goal is that this is a model of architectural practice. These are the things that architects everywhere need to be concerned with. So, um, one of the other things, um, you know, in the book where you talk about um, nonconformist. Mm. Um, I think that's a struggle in architecture because the, the, the profession tends to be risk adverse mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and non-political and, you know, don't rock the boat, um, you know, you know, mm -hmm. e e et cetera. Um, and then combined with that, as you, you're talking about, you know, the inherent racism in the work and the, and the lack of, 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 you know, um, Black architects, um, um, that together, I think, makes it harder for the discussion we just had and for hip hop architecture mm -hmm. um, to really be a model of practice, right? Yeah. Because it's easy, and you talked in, in the book about, um, I think it was when you were here in Minneapolis and someone asked you, well, what would the program for a hip hop architecture uh, <laughs> building look like, right? <laughs> as yeah. i recall um yeah, yeah. It, it's just it's just wrong it's just wrong headed to even ask that question um but it's it's um yeah it's 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 tough because you know um it's hard to let go of what architecture believes itself to be and um and there's so much goodness in there there's so much like really 
amazing, innovative, spectacular work that happens. And we were awed by it um, all the time. Um, but it starts to fall apart when we understand that that it it has, you know, the things that get revered as as stellar, amazing works of architecture from every layer of practice to policy to to um, to academia and education um, are are things that that don't care about people at all. Like you're talking about how architects don't want to spend time with people. Like it's 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 all about this object. It's all about the thing. It's all about you know the materials. It's all about this this experience. But you know this this like image this visual experience instead of a lived experience, um, a, a social experience, like how does this move you? What does it make you do? What kind of society does it set up? Um, where are the people, <laughs> right? You know, there was a time, and now that we have more digital renderings and, and people available, it, you know, we see people all over. Yeah, but you, but you before know that, in the renderings. <laughs> before that, you never saw people in the renderings or in the photographs. Like you photo, even now in architectural photography, you don't see people in the photographs, rarely. And it's like, why are you trying to remove the people from the buildings? Um, and so my, my primary goal is not to transform people into hip hop architects. My primary goal is for people to understand cultural identity as a critical component of architectural production across the board. Yeah, and, and, and that is sorely lacking. You know, the, the, the dominant cultural identity is the one that we're all supposed to ascribe exactly. to as we, as we look at how architecture is produced, marketed, you know, et cetera. Um, but, but, but you're right. And as we continue to, you know, diversify our country, you know, that, that continues to be a problem, you know, you know, the, the type of space, um, how you feel welcome, you know, all of those things are counter to the way um, it, it's produced. Yeah. So um, it's seven, seems to be 758. We can move into some Q and A. Mm -hmm. Great. Sure. All right. Um, so one of the questions asked, um, could you talk about um, some female um, architects? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I, I was really intentional to, to bring in um, uh, women in, um, in the exhibition and in the conversations and in all of the book. Uh, so, you know, Amanda Williams' work, um, uh, uh, Lauren Halsey, uh, Sarah Zude, who's going to be talking, um, presenting in the same series. Um, they're all in the book. Uh, Ujiji Davis, who's a young up and coming landscape architect. Uh, my sister, Nina Cook John, uh, Hansi Better, Baraza. Um, you know, these are the people that I hang with. These are the people that I talk to. These are people I talk about and see and watch their work and see it growing and, and, and transforming. Uh, Jennifer Newsom, of course. Um, and, uh, uh, but, you know, the, the conversation about gender is so important to, to have within the context of, of hip hop and hip hop culture, right? Um, and this is why I, I had a whole section just on that, right? And it's, you know, in the second volume, it's, it's legitimacy, authenticity, race, gender. <laughs> let's get this right. stuff off the, uh, you know, let's confront this stuff right at the beginning so that we know the terms under which we're talking, we're, we're, we're addressing every, all of this. Um, because it's not okay to say women aren't included. You have to make that effort and say, okay, where are the women? What are they doing? They, they are um, stalwarts in this industry, even though their numbers are so few within the, the licensed professional ranks, right? I think it's, still south of 500 black women who are who are now um, licensed architects in this country, um, which is criminal really. But um, in the context of hip hop, uh, it you know, it's hard to 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 um, disassociate the legacy of hip hop from its, you know, from homophobia, misogyny, violence, uh, all of these negative societal um, pieces. Um, 
my responses to, the, to those is always twofold. One, you know, architect, you know, and I talk about this in the book, like, well, architecture <laughs> is misogynistic, uh, uh, homophobic, uh, racist, violent, you know, and it has done that as a legacy, but it's still revered as this, like, um, you know, this, this beacon of hope within our society. Um, but the other thing is that, you know, the culture of hip hop is like that because it amplifies what's around it. It amplifies what it's fed. It amplifies what is there. And um, it didn't create the situation. It just, it just puts a really powerful lens on it. And that's not to apologize for any of what's in hip hop. It's to confront it directly and say it's there, but why is it there? And how can we understand architectural production through that? So women are always going to be in the conversation, any conversation that 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 I have about architecture. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, the anger and frustration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's a question a question there about anger and frustration um and you know um you know to to two black men on, on the screen you know we can we can relate to anger and frustration mm -hmm. um and uh, you know my wife will tell you that uh i was at a meeting the other the other night and we won't say what it was about but it produced a lot of anger and frustration for the rest of the night. And I love her because she put up with me while I paced around and talked about people. Um, but in the, in the work and, and as we, you know, really are challenging and we're not conformist and, you yeah. know, you know, and I also think um, out of anger and frustration and pain can come, you know, real change, uh, you know, real beauty, you know, um, how are you, you know, how have you dealt with some of those challenges and how do you see those challenges sort of across, across the profession as people are really, we really start thinking about this should be a way of architectural practice, humanizing architecture, yeah. uh, you know, really, you know, making the kind of difference um, that architecture should. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it has to be, um, it has to be fuel, it has to become fuel for 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 creation it has to be creative energy right um it is um you know if again if we think about music and again hip-hop architecture is not about music but if we think about music um some of the most powerful music comes out of pain and loss and suffering and um and black people in this country have a deep long legacy of creating like uh, using um, frustration and anger as a primary creative force. Um, and um, yeah, and I, I had uh, uh, in the book, I talk about, um, actually not in the book, in, in this, this, this new piece that just came out in um, Mass Context, Mass mm -hmm. Context 33, which is called Vig Vigilantism. Um, co-edited, guest edited by Shaheen, um, um, Shaheen Rabardi and, and, um, and, uh, um, and Jermaine Barnes that just came out a couple weeks ago or a week ago. Um, and I wrote a piece there describing a, um, a, 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 a studio that I did that was about blackness. It was like, I could say it was my blackest semester ever <laughs> at Syracuse. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, and we had this, the students do these collages about um, the situation, the history of Syracuse, the history of Blackness in, our, in, in, in Syracuse. And um, they said, you know, that, you know, and, and I was like, like, how do you feel about these things? And one student said, I feel angry, you know, I was like, okay, what is the architecture of anger? <laughs> how can that be a productive creative force right um and we explored that for the rest of the semester and it was really really powerful so i really suggest people to um to read that essay if they have a chance but um the one other thing i'd say that i seeded at the beginning in in the in the manifesto is right after i heard about um 
Dr. Gates being arrested in front of his own house in Cambridge, trying to get in. And of course, the cop, the white cop assumes that um, that he is uh, trying to break in. <laughs> um, right. And of course, like anybody would, Dr. Gates loses it on this guy. Like, I'm trying to get into my own fucking house. Like, leave me, <laughs> leave me alone. But being a black man in America, no matter how rich, no matter how famous, no matter how educated you are, that is grounds for being arrested and being thrown in jail. Um, and my anger and frustration about probably connected because I'm an academic as well and, and, and educated and know that the same thing can happen to me no matter how big or how much people, how many people know who I am. Um, and that anger is so potent that I'm like, you know, this is, and I talked to my friend, Mitesh Dixit about that. And he was like, that anger and frustration that you have, that's what needs to go into your book. I'm like, okay. And then the next day I tapped into that. And then I, on a sticky note or in my notebook, I just like wrote out the first paragraph of that disclaimer and that, and, and, it, and it's remained virtually unchanged for two years before putting the rest of the book together. And where, how it came out was, you know, this is not for you. <laughs> like, I'm not doing this to please you, to please this architectural machine, this architectural establishment, the academic machine. It's like, I'm doing this because this is work that needs to be, to be shared and shown. I'm doing this because it's, you know, quite frankly, a calling. Like, this work needs to happen by someone. All right. Well, I think there's maybe one. We pretty much covered all the questions. So really, um, we, we were going to be done by 8.15. It's 8.08. So um, I want to thank you, Seku, for like an incredible conversation and presentation. Um, it, it was just great. And I encourage everyone to uh, not be a conformist, be a disruptor, <laughs> and practice hip-hop architecture. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you guys so much. That was a, a really amazing talk. And man, I'm jealous of all the students who get to dig into this with you, dig into these ideas in the future. Um, that's gonna be such a privilege. And it was a privilege for us to have both of you take part in this series. Um, so thank you, Seku, thanks, Paul. Um, and I want to also thank everybody for tuning in. I wanna thank our partners, Dunwoody College, AIA, Minnesota, MSP, NOMA, and Minneapolis College. And then I just want to put a little plug um, for October 15th at 12 noon, we'll have Sarah Zude, um, and that will be hosted by the Minneapolis College, and that's going to be a really amazing talk as well. So I really hope that you can check that out. So thanks, everybody, and good night. <laughs>